The Yuan Dynasty, Chinese, Yuan Chao Pinyin, Yuan Chao, officially the Great Yuan Chinese, Da Yuan Pinyin, Da Yuan, Yihi Yuan Ulus, was the empire or ruling dynasty of China established by Kublai Khan, leader of the Mongolian Borjigan clan. It followed the Song Dynasty and preceded the Ming Dynasty. Although the Mongols had ruled territories including modern-day North China for decades, it was not until 1271 that Kublai Khan officially proclaimed the dynasty in the traditional Chinese style, and the conquest was not complete until 1279. His realm was, by this point, isolated from the other Khanates and controlled most of modern-day China and its surrounding areas, including modern Mongolia. It was the first foreign dynasty to rule all of China and lasted until 1368, after which the rebuked Genghisid rulers retreated to their Mongolian homeland and continued to rule the northern Yuan dynasty. Some of the Mongolian emperors of the Yuan mastered the Chinese language, while others only used their native language i.e. Mongolian and the Fags Pa script. The Yuan dynasty was the Khanate ruled by the successors of Mong Khan after the division of the Mongol Empire. In official Chinese histories, the Yuan dynasty bore the mandate of heaven. The dynasty was established by Kublai Khan, yet he placed his grandfather Genghis Khan on the imperial records as the official founder of the dynasty as Taizu. In the proclamation of the dynastic name, Kublai announced the name of the new dynasty as Great Yuan and claimed the succession of former Chinese dynasties from the three sovereigns and five emperors to the Tang dynasty. In addition to Emperor of China, Kublai Khan also claimed the title of Great Khan, supreme over the other successor Khanates, the Chagatai, the Golden Horde, and the Ilkhanate. As such, the Yuan was also sometimes referred to as the Empire of the Great Khan. However, while the claim of supremacy by the Yuan emperors was at times recognized by the Western Khans, their subservience was nominal and each continued its own separate development. Name In 1271, Kublai Khan imposed the name Great Yuan Chinese, Da Yuan Pinyin, Da Yuan, Wade Giles, Ta Yuan, establishing the Yuan dynasty. Da Yuan. Da Yuan is from the clause, Da Zai Gan Yuan, Da Zai Qian Yuan, Great as Qian, the primal. In the commentaries on the Classic of Changes section regarding the first hexagram Qian Gan, the counterpart in the Mongolian language was Dai An Ulus, also rendered as Ikh Yuan Uls or Yika Yuan Ulus. In Mongolian, Dai An Great Yuan is often used in conjunction with the Yeke Mongol Ulus, lit. Great Mongol State. Resulting in Dai on Yeke Mongol Ulus Mongolian script, meaning Great Mongol State. The Yuan dynasty is also known by Westerners as the Mongol Dynasty or Mongol Dynasty of China, similar to the names Manchu Dynasty or Manchu Dynasty of China, which were used by Westerners for the Qing Dynasty. Furthermore, the Yuan is sometimes known as the Empire of the Great Khan or Khanate of the Great Khan, which particularly appeared on some Yuan maps, since Yuan emperors held the nominal title of Great Khan. Nevertheless, both terms can also refer to the Khanate within the Mongol Empire directly ruled by Great Khans before the actual establishment of the Yuan dynasty by Kublai Khan in 1271. History Background Genghis Khan united the Mongol tribes of the steppes and became Great Khan in 1206. He and his successors expanded the Mongol Empire across Asia. Under the reign of Genghis' third son, Ogede Khan, the Mongols destroyed the weakened Jin dynasty in 1234, conquering most of northern China. Ogede offered his nephew Kublai a position in Xingzhou, Hebei. Kublai was unable to read Chinese but had several Han teachers attached to him since his early years by his mother Sorgatani. He sought the counsel of Chinese Buddhist and Confucian advisors. Monk Khan succeeded Ogede's son, Gayak, as Great Khan in 1251. He granted his brother Kublai control over Mongol-held territories in China. Kublai built schools for Confucian scholars, issued paper money, revived Chinese rituals, and endorsed policies that stimulated agricultural and commercial growth. He adopted as his capital city Kaiping in Inner Mongolia, later renamed Shangdu. Many Han Chinese and Khitan defected to the Mongols to fight against the Jin. 
Two Han Chinese leaders, Shi Tians, Lu Heima, Lu Heima Lu Ni, and the Khitan Shao Zala, Shao Zala defected and commanded the three Tumans in the Mongol army. Lu Heima and Shi Tian served Ogade Khan. Lu Heima and Shi Tiangshang led armies against Western Sha for the Mongols. There were four Han Tumans and three Khitan Tumans, with each Tuman consisting of 10,000 troops. The three Khitan generals Shimobidir, Shimo Bei Da Er Tabuyir Ta Bu Yi Er and Shaojasiji Zhangshi Zhang commanded the three Khitan Tumans and the four Han generals Zhang Ru, Yan Shi, Shi Tians, and Lu Hema commanded the four Han Tumans under Ogade Khan. Shi Tians was a Han Chinese who lived in the Jin dynasty. Interethnic marriage between Han and Yurchin became common at this time. His father was Shi Bingzi, Shi Bing Ji, Shi Ping Chi. Shi Bingzi was married to a Yurchin woman surname Na Ho and a Han Chinese woman surname Chong. It is unknown which of them was Shi Tianzi's mother. Shi Tians was married to two Yurchin women, a Han Chinese woman, and a Korean woman, and his son Shi Gang was born to one of his Yurchin wives. The surnames of his Yurchin wives were Mo Nine and Na Ho, the surname of his Korean wife was Li, and the surname of his Han Chinese wife was Shi. Shi Tians defected to Mongol forces upon their invasion of the Jin dynasty. His son Shi Gang married a Kare woman. The Kare were Mongolified Turkic people and were considered part of the Mongol nation. Shi Tians, Shi Tianze, Zhang Ru, Chang Ju, Zhang Ru, and Yan Shi, Yan Shi, Yan Shi, and other high-ranking Chinese who served in the Jin dynasty and defected to the Mongols helped build the structure for the administration of the new state. Chagan Sagan and Zhang Ru jointly launched an attack on the Song dynasty ordered by Torajin Khan. Monk Khan commenced a military campaign against the Chinese Song dynasty in southern China. The Mongol force that invaded southern China was far greater than the force they sent to invade the Middle East in 1256. He died in 1259 without a successor. Kublai returned from fighting the Song in 1260 when he learned that his brother, Ariq Bok, was challenging his claim to the throne. Kublai convened a Kurultai in Kaiping that elected him Great Khan. A rival Kurultai in Mongolia proclaimed Ariq Bok Great Khan, beginning a civil war. Kublai depended on the cooperation of his Chinese subjects to ensure that his army received ample resources. He bolstered his popularity among his subjects by modeling his government on the bureaucracy of traditional Chinese dynasties and adopting the Chinese era name of Zongtong. Ariq Bok was hampered by inadequate supplies and surrendered in 1264. All of the three Western Khanates Golden Horde, Chagatai Khanate and Ilkhanate became functionally autonomous, although only the Ilkhans truly recognized Kublai as Great Khan. Civil strife had permanently divided the Mongol Empire. Topic. Rule of Kublai Khan Topic. Early years Instability troubled the early years of Kublai Khan's reign. Ogede's grandson Kaidu refused to submit to Kublai and threatened the western frontier of Kublai's domain. The hostile but weakened Song dynasty remained an obstacle in the south. Kublai secured the northeast border in 1259 by installing the hostage prince Wanjing as the ruler of Korea, making it a Mongol tributary state. Kublai was also threatened by domestic unrest. Li Tan, the son-in-law of a powerful official, instigated a revolt against Mongol rule in 1262. After successfully suppressing the revolt, Kublai curbed the influence of the Han advisors in his court. He feared that his dependence on Chinese officials left him vulnerable to future revolts and defections to the Song. Kublai's government after 1262 was a compromise between preserving Mongol interests in China and satisfying the demands of his Chinese subjects. He instituted the reforms proposed by his Chinese advisors by centralizing the bureaucracy, expanding the circulation of paper money, and maintaining the traditional monopolies on salt and iron. He restored the imperial secretariat and left the local administrative structure of past Chinese dynasties unchanged. However, Kublai rejected plans to revive the Confucian imperial examinations and divided Yuan society into three, later four, classes with the Han occupying the lowest rank. Kublai's Chinese advisors still wielded significant power in the government, but their official rank was nebulous. Founding the dynasty. 
Kublai readied the move of the Mongol capital from Karakoram in Mongolia to Kanbalik in 1264, constructing a new city near the former Yurchin capital Zongdu, now modern Beijing, in 1266. In 1271, Kublai formally claimed the Mandate of Heaven and declared that 1272 was the first year of the Great Yuan Chinese, Da Yuan in the style of a traditional Chinese dynasty. The name of the dynasty originated from the I Ching and describes the origin of the universe, or a primal force. Kublai proclaimed Kanbalik the great capital, or Daidu Dadu, Chinese, da do in Chinese of the dynasty. The era name was changed to Ziyuan to herald a new era of Chinese history. The adoption of a dynastic name legitimized Mongol rule by integrating the government into the narrative of traditional Chinese political succession. Kublai evoked his public image as a sage emperor by following the rituals of Confucian propriety and ancestor veneration, while simultaneously retaining his roots as a leader from the steppes. Kublai Khan promoted commercial, scientific, and cultural growth. He supported the merchants of the Silk Road trade network by protecting the Mongol postal system, constructing infrastructure, providing loans that financed trade caravans, and encouraging the circulation of paper banknotes. Chow Chow. During the beginning of the Yuan dynasty, the Mongols continued issuing coins, however, under Kulig Khan coins were completely replaced by paper money. It wasn't until the reign of Tan Timur that the government of the Yuan dynasty would attempt to reintroduce copper coinage for circulation. Pax Mongolica, Mongol peace, enabled the spread of technologies, commodities, and culture between China and the West. Kublai expanded the Grand Canal from southern China to Daidu in the north. Mongol rule was cosmopolitan under Kublai Khan. He welcomed foreign visitors to his court, such as the Venetian merchant Marco Polo, who wrote the most influential European account of Yuan China. Marco Polo's travels would later inspire many others like Christopher Columbus to chart a passage to the Far East in search of its legendary wealth. <laughs> <laughs> Military conquests and campaigns After strengthening his government in northern China, Kublai pursued an expansionist policy in line with the tradition of Mongol and Chinese imperialism. He renewed a massive drive against the Song dynasty to the south. Kublai besieged Xiangyang between 1268 and 1273, the last obstacle in his way to capture the rich Yangtze River basin. An unsuccessful naval expedition was undertaken against Japan in 1274. Kublai captured the Song capital of Hangzhou in 1276, the wealthiest city of China. Song loyalists escaped from the capital and enthroned a young child as Emperor Bing of Song. The Mongols defeated the loyalists at the Battle of Yamen in 1279. The last Song emperor drowned, bringing an end to the Song dynasty. The conquest of the Song reunited northern and southern China for the first time in 300 years. The Yuan dynasty created a Han army. Han Jun out of defected Jin troops and an army of defected Song troops called the newly submitted army. Xin Fu Jun Kublai's government faced financial difficulties after 1279. Wars and construction projects had drained the Mongol treasury. Efforts to raise and collect tax revenues were plagued by corruption and political scandals. Mishandled military expeditions followed the financial problems. Kublai's second invasion of Japan in 1281 failed because of an inauspicious typhoon. Kublai botched his campaigns against Annam, Champa, and Java, but won a Pyrrhic victory against Burma. The expeditions were hampered by disease, an inhospitable climate, and a tropical terrain unsuitable for the mounted warfare of the Mongols. The Tran dynasty which ruled Annam Dai Viet defeated the Mongols at the Battle of Bok Dang 1288. Annam, Burma, and Champa recognized Mongol hegemony and established tributary relations with the Yuan dynasty. Internal strife threatened Kublai within his empire. Kublai Khan suppressed rebellions challenging his rule in Tibet and the northeast. His favorite wife died in 1281 and so did his chosen heir in 1285. Kublai grew despondent and retreated from his duties as emperor. He fell ill in 1293 and died on the 18th of February 1294. Topic. Successors after Kublai Timur Khan Following the conquest of Dali in 1253, the former ruling Duan dynasty were appointed as Maharaja. 
Local chieftains were appointed as Tusi, recognized as imperial officials by the Yuan, Ming, and Qing era governments, principally in the province of Yunnan. Succession for the Yuan dynasty, however, was an intractable problem, later causing much strife and internal struggle. This emerged as early as the end of Kublai's reign. Kublai originally named his eldest son, Zhenjin, as the crown prince, but he died before Kublai in 1285. Thus, Zhenjin's third son, with the support of his mother Kokejin and the minister Bayan, succeeded the throne and ruled as Timur Khan, or Emperor Chengzong, from 1294 to 1307. Timur Khan decided to maintain and continue much of the work begun by his grandfather. He also made peace with the Western Mongol Khanates as well as neighboring countries such as Vietnam, which recognized his nominal suzerainty and paid tributes for a few decades. However, the corruption in the Yuan dynasty began during the reign of Timur Khan. Topic. Kulig Khan Kulig Khan Emperor Wuzong came to the throne after the death of Timur Khan. Unlike his predecessor, he did not continue Kublai's work, largely rejecting his objectives. Most significantly he introduced a policy called New Deals, focused on monetary reforms. During his short reign 1307 the government fell into financial difficulties, partly due to bad decisions made by Kulig. By the time he died, China was in severe debt and the Yuan court faced popular discontent. Ayyubrawada Bayantu Khan The fourth Yuan emperor, Bayantu Khan Ayyubrawada, was a competent emperor. He was the first Yuan emperor to actively support and adopt mainstream Chinese culture after the reign of Kublai, to the discontent of some Mongol elite. He had been mentored by Li Meng, a Confucian academic. He made many reforms, including the liquidation of the Department of State Affairs Chinese, Shang Shu Sheng which resulted in the execution of five of the highest ranking officials. Starting in 1313 the traditional imperial examinations were reintroduced for prospective officials, testing their knowledge on significant historical works. Also, he codified much of the law, as well as publishing or translating a number of Chinese books and works. Gagin Khan and Yesun Timur Emperor Gagin Khan, Ayyubrawada's son and successor, ruled for only two years, from 1321 to 1323. He continued his father's policies to reform the government based on the Confucian principles, with the help of his newly appointed Grand Chancellor Baiju. During his reign, the Da Yuan Tong Ji Chinese, da Yuan Tong Ji, the Comprehensive Institutions of the Great Yuan a huge collection of codes and regulations of the Yuan dynasty begun by his father, was formally promulgated. Gagin was assassinated in a coup involving five princes from a rival faction, perhaps steppe elite opposed to Confucian reforms. They placed Yesun Timur or Tidingdi on the throne, and, after an unsuccessful attempt to calm the princes, he also succumbed to regicide. Before Yesun Timur's reign, China had been relatively free from popular rebellions after the reign of Kublai. Yuan control, however, began to break down in those regions inhabited by ethnic minorities. The occurrence of these revolts and the subsequent suppression aggravated the financial difficulties of the Yuan government. The government had to adopt some measure to increase revenue, such as selling offices, as well as curtailing its spending on some items. <laughs> Jayatu Khan II Timur when Yesun Timur died in Chengdu in 1328, Tu Timur was recalled to Kanbalik by the Kipchak commander L. Timur. He was installed as the emperor, emperor Wenzong in Kanbalik, while Yesun Timur's son Ragaba succeeded to the throne in Chengdu with the support of Yesun Timur's favorite retainer Dalit Shah. Gaining support from princes and officers in northern China and some other parts of the dynasty, Kanbalik based Tu Timur eventually won the civil war against Ragaba known as the War of the Two Capitals. Afterwards, Tu Timur abdicated in favor of his brother Kusala, who was backed by Chagatai Khan Eljijidi, and announced Kanbalik's intent to welcome him. However, Kusala suddenly died only four days after a banquet with Tu Timur. He was supposedly killed with poison by El Timur, and Tu Timur then remounted the throne. Tu Timur also managed to send delegates to the Western Mongol Khanates such as Golden Horde and Ilkhanate to be accepted as the suzerain of Mongol world. However, he was mainly a puppet of the powerful official El Timur during his latter three-year reign. 
El Timur purged pro Kusala officials and brought power to warlords, whose despotic rule clearly marked the decline of the dynasty. Due to the fact that the bureaucracy was dominated by El Timur, Tu Timur is known for his cultural contribution instead. He adopted many measures honoring Confucianism and promoting Chinese cultural values. His most concrete effort to patronize Chinese learning was founding the Academy of the Pavilion of the Star of Literature Chinese, Kui Zhang Zhe Zhe Shi Yuan first established in the spring of 1329 and designed to undertake a number of tasks relating to the transmission of Confucian high culture to the Mongolian imperial establishment. The Academy was responsible for compiling and publishing a number of books, but its most important achievement was its compilation of a vast institutional compendium named Jingxi Dadian Chinese. Jingxi Dadian Tu Timur supported Zhu Zai's Neo-Confucianism and also devoted himself in Buddhism. Topic. Tan Timur After the death of Tu Timur in 1332 and subsequent death of Rinchenbal Emperor Ningzong the same year, the 13-year-old Togan Timur Emperor Hizong, the last of the nine successors of Kublai Khan, was summoned back from Guangxi and succeeded to the throne. After El Timur's death, Bayan became as powerful an official as El Timur had been in the beginning of his long reign. As Togan Timur grew, he came to disapprove of Bayan's autocratic rule. In 1340 he allied himself with Bayan's nephew Taktoa, who was in discord with Bayan, and banished Bayan by coup. With the dismissal of Bayan, Taktoa seized the power of the court. His first administration clearly exhibited fresh new spirit. He also gave a few early signs of a new and positive direction in central government. One of his successful projects was to finish the long-stalled official histories of the Liao, Jin, and Song dynasties, which were eventually completed in 1345. Yet, Taktoa resigned his office with the approval of Togan Timur, marking the end of his first administration, and he was not called back until 1349. Topic. Decline of the Empire The final years of the Yuan dynasty were marked by struggle, famine, and bitterness among the populace. In time, Kublai Khan's successors lost all influence on other Mongol lands across Asia, while the Mongols beyond the Middle Kingdom saw them as too Chinese. Gradually, they lost influence in China as well. The reigns of the later Yuan emperors were short and marked by intrigues and rivalries. Uninterested in administration, they were separated from both the army and the populace, and China was torn by dissension and unrest. Outlaws ravaged the country without interference from the weakening Yuan armies. From the late 1340s onwards, people in the countryside suffered from frequent natural disasters such as droughts, floods and the resulting famines, and the government's lack of effective policy led to a loss of popular support. In 1351, the Red Turban Rebellion started and grew into a nationwide uprising. In 1354, when Tatoa led a large army to crush the Red Turban rebels, Togan Timur suddenly dismissed him for fear of betrayal. This resulted in Togan Timur's restoration of power on the one hand and a rapid weakening of the central government on the other. He had no choice but to rely on local warlords' military power, and gradually lost his interest in politics and ceased to intervene in political struggles. He fled north to Chengdu from Kanbalik present-day Beijing in 1368 after the approach of the forces of the Ming Dynasty 1368-1644, founded by Zhu Yuanzang in the south. He had tried to regain Kanbalik, which eventually failed. He died in Yingcheng, located in present-day Inner Mongolia, two years later, 1370. Yingcheng was seized by the Ming shortly after his death. Some royal family members still lived in Henan today. The Prince of Liang, Basalawarmi established a separate pocket of resistance to the Ming in Yunnan and Guizhou, but his forces were decisively defeated by the Ming in 1381. By 1387 the remaining Yuan forces in Manchuria under Naghachu had also surrendered to the Ming dynasty. The Yuan remnants retreated to Mongolia after the fall of Yingcheng to the Ming in 1370, where the name Great Yuan da Yuan was formally carried on, and is known as the Northern Yuan dynasty. Topic. Impact A rich cultural diversity developed during the Yuan dynasty. The major cultural achievements were the development of drama and the novel and the increased use of the written vernacular. The political unity of China and much of Central Asia promoted trade between East and West. 
The Mongols' extensive West Asian and European contacts produced a fair amount of cultural exchange. The other cultures and peoples in the Mongol World Empire also very much influenced China. It had significantly eased trade and commerce across Asia until its decline. The communications between Yuan dynasty and its ally and subordinate in Persia, the Ilkhanate, encouraged this development. Buddhism had a great influence in the Yuan government, and the Tibetan Rite Tantric Buddhism had significantly influenced China during this period. The Muslims of the Yuan dynasty introduced Middle Eastern cartography, astronomy, medicine, clothing, and diet in East Asia. Eastern crops such as carrots, turnips, new varieties of lemons, eggplants, and melons, high-quality granulated sugar, and cotton were all either introduced or successfully popularized during the Yuan dynasty. Western musical instruments were introduced to enrich Chinese performing arts. From this period dates the conversion to Islam, by Muslims of Central Asia, of growing numbers of Chinese in the Northwest and Southwest. Nestorianism and Roman Catholicism also enjoyed a period of toleration. Buddhism, especially Tibetan Buddhism flourished, although Taoism endured certain persecutions in favor of Buddhism from the Yuan government. Confucian governmental practices and examinations based on the classics, which had fallen into disuse in North China during the period of disunity, were reinstated by the Yuan court, probably in the hope of maintaining order over Han society. Advances were realized in the fields of travel literature, cartography, geography, and scientific education. Certain Chinese innovations and products, such as purified saltpeter, printing techniques, porcelain, playing cards, and medical literature, were exported to Europe and Western Asia, while the production of thin glass and cloisonné became popular in China. The Yuan exercised a profound influence on the Chinese Ming dynasty. The Ming Emperor Zhu Yuanzang admired the Mongols' unification of China and adopted its garrison system. Aside from the ancient Roman embassies, the first recorded travels by Europeans to China and back date from this time. The most famous traveler of the period was the Venetian Marco Polo, whose account of his trip to Cambaluc, the capital of the Great Khan, and of life there astounded the people of Europe. The account of his travels, Il Milioni or, The Million, known in English as The Travels of Marco Polo, appeared about the year 1299. Some doubted the accuracy of Marco Polo's accounts due to the lack of mentioning the Great Wall of China, tea houses, which would have been a prominent site since Europeans had yet to adopt a tea culture, as well the practice of foot binding by the women in capital of the Great Khan. Recent studies however show that Polo's account are largely accurate and unique. The Yuan undertook extensive public works. Among Kublai Khan's top engineers and scientists was the astronomer Guo Shoujing, who was tasked with many public works projects and helped the Yuan reform the lunisolar calendar to provide an accuracy of 365.2425 days of the year, which was only 26 seconds off the modern Gregorian calendar's measurement. Road and water communications were reorganized and improved. To provide against possible famines, granaries were ordered built throughout the empire. The city of Beijing was rebuilt with new palace grounds that included artificial lakes, hills and mountains, and parks. During the Yuan period, Beijing became the terminus of the Grand Canal of China, which was completely renovated. These commercially oriented improvements encouraged overland and maritime commerce throughout Asia and facilitated direct Chinese contacts with Europe. Chinese travelers to the West were able to provide assistance in such areas as hydraulic engineering. Contacts with the West also brought the introduction to China of a major food crop, sorghum, along with other foreign food products and methods of preparation. The Yuan dynasty was the first time that non-native Chinese people ruled all of China. In the historiography of Mongolia, it is generally considered to be the continuation of the Mongol Empire. Mongols are widely known to worship the eternal heaven, and according to the traditional Mongolian ideology Yuan is considered to be the beginning of an infinite number of beings, the foundation of peace and happiness, state power, the dream of many peoples, besides it there is nothing great or precious." In traditional historiography of China, on the other hand, the Yuan dynasty is usually considered to be the legitimate dynasty between the Song dynasty and the Ming dynasty. Note, however, Yuan dynasty is traditionally often extended to cover the Mongol Empire before Kublai Khan's formal establishment of the Yuan in 1271, partly because Kublai had his grandfather Genghis Khan placed on the official record as the founder of the dynasty or Taizu Chinese. 
Tithe. Despite the traditional historiography as well as the official views including the government of the Ming dynasty which overthrew the Yuan dynasty, there also exist Chinese people who did not consider the Yuan dynasty as a legitimate dynasty of China, but rather as a period of foreign domination. The latter believe that Hans were treated as second-class citizens, and that China stagnated economically and scientifically. The dynasty chose white as its imperial color, which corresponds to the metal element according to the theory of the five elements Wuxing. Note that the metal element does not follow from the Song's dynastic element 5 in the creation sequence of the five elements. Instead, it follows from the Jin dynast's dynastic element Earth. Although the Yuan did not openly announce it, its choice of white as its imperial color suggests that it considered Jin, another conquest dynasty, rather than the Han Chinese Song dynasty, as its rightful predecessor. The dragon clothing of imperial China was used by the Ilkhanids, the Chinese Wangdi emperor title was used by the Ilkhanids due to heavy clout upon the Mongols of the Chinese system of politics. Seals with Chinese characters were created by the Ilkhanids themselves besides the seals they received from the Yuan dynasty which contain references to a Chinese government organization. <laughs> government The structure of the Yuan government took shape during the reign of Kublai Khan while some changes took place such as the functions of certain institutions, the essential components of the government bureaucracy remained intact from the beginning to the end of the dynasty in 1368. The system of bureaucracy created by Kublai Khan reflected various cultures in the empire, including that of the Hans, Khitans, Yurchins, Mongols, and Tibetan Buddhists. While the official terminology of the institutions may indicate the government structure was almost purely that of native Chinese dynasties, the Yuan bureaucracy actually consisted of a mix of elements from different cultures. The Chinese-style elements of the bureaucracy mainly came from the native Tang, Song, as well as Khitan Liao and Yurchin Jin dynasties. Chinese advisors such as Liu Bingzhong and Yao Shu gave strong influence to Kublai's early court, and the central government administration was established within the first decade of Kublai's reign. This government adopted the traditional Chinese tripartite division of authority among civil, military, and censorial offices, including the Central Secretariat to manage civil affairs, the Privy Council to manage military affairs, and the censorate to conduct internal surveillance and inspection. The actual functions of both central and local government institutions, however, showed a major overlap between the civil and military jurisdictions, due to the Mongol traditional reliance on military institutions and offices as the core of governance. Nevertheless, such a civilian bureaucracy, with the central secretariat as the top institution that was directly or indirectly responsible for most other governmental agencies such as the traditional Chinese-style six ministries, was created in China. At various times another central government institution called the Department of State Affairs that mainly dealt with finance was established such as during the reign of Kulig Khan or Emperor Wuzong, but was usually abandoned shortly afterwards. While the existence of these central government departments and the six ministries which had been introduced since the Sui and Tang dynasties gave a sinicized image in the Yuan administration, the actual functions of these ministries also reflected how Mongolian priorities and policies reshaped and redirected those institutions. For example, the authority of the Yuan legal system, the Ministry of Justice, did not extend to legal cases involving Mongols and Semyurin, who had separate courts of justice. Cases involving members of more than one ethnic group were decided by a mixed board consisting of Chinese and Mongols. Another example was the insignificance of the Ministry of War compared with native Chinese dynasties, as the real military authority in Yuan times resided in the Privy Council. Topic. Science and technology Topic. Mathematics. Advances in polynomial algebra were made by mathematicians during the Yuan era. The mathematician Zhu Shiji solved simultaneous equations with up to four unknowns using a rectangular array of coefficients, equivalent to modern matrices. Zhu used a method of elimination to reduce the simultaneous equations to a single equation with only one unknown. His method is described in the Jade Mirror of the Four Unknowns, written in 1303. The opening pages contain a diagram of Pascal's triangle. 
The summation of a finite arithmetic series is also covered in the book, Guo Shoujing Applied Mathematics to the Construction of Calendars. He was one of the first mathematicians in China to work on spherical trigonometry. Go derived a cubic interpolation formula for his astronomical calculations. His calendar, the Shoshi Li, Shoshi Li or calendar for fixing the seasons, was disseminated in 1281 as the official calendar of the Yuan dynasty. The calendar may have been influenced solely by the work of Song dynasty astronomer Shen Kuo or possibly by the work of Arab astronomers. There are no explicit signs of Muslim influences in the Shoshi calendar, but Mongol rulers were known to be interested in Muslim calendars. Mathematical knowledge from the Middle East was introduced to China under the Mongols, and Muslim astronomers brought Arabic numerals to China in the 13th century. Medicine The physicians of the Yuan court came from diverse cultures. Healers were divided into non-Mongol physicians called Otashi and traditional Mongol shamans. The Mongols characterized Otashi doctors by their use of herbal remedies, which was distinguished from the spiritual cures of Mongol shamanism. Physicians received official support from the Yuan government and were given special legal privileges. Kublai created the Imperial Academy of Medicine to manage medical treatises and the education of new doctors. Confucian scholars were attracted to the medical profession because it ensured a high income and medical ethics were compatible with Confucian virtues. The Chinese medical tradition of the Yuan had four great schools that the Yuan inherited from the Jin dynasty. All four schools were based on the same intellectual foundation, but advocated different theoretical approaches toward medicine. Under the Mongols, the practice of Chinese medicine spread to other parts of the empire. Chinese physicians were brought along military campaigns by the Mongols as they expanded towards the west. Chinese medical techniques such as acupuncture, moxibustion, pulse diagnosis, and various herbal drugs and elixirs were transmitted westward to the Middle East and the rest of the empire. Several medical advances were made in the Yuan period. The physician Wei Yilin invented a suspension method for reducing dislocated joints, which he performed using anesthetics. The Mongol physician Hu Sui described the importance of a healthy diet in a 1330 medical treatise. Western medicine was also practiced in China by the Nestorian Christians of the Yuan court, where it was sometimes labeled as Wei Wei or Muslim medicine. The Nestorian physician Jesus the Interpreter founded the Office of Western Medicine in 1263 during the reign of Kublai. Wei Wei doctors staffed at two imperial hospitals were responsible for treating the imperial family and members of the court. Chinese physicians opposed Western medicine because its humoral system contradicted the yin-yang and wuxing philosophy underlying traditional Chinese medicine. No Chinese translation of Western medical works is known, but it is possible that the Chinese had access to Avicenna's The Canon of Medicine. Topic. Printing and publishing The Mongol rulers patronized the Yuan printing industry. Chinese printing technology was transferred to the Mongols through Kingdom of Kocho and Tibetan intermediaries. Some Yuan documents such as Wang Zhen's Nong Shu were printed with earthenware movable type, a technology invented in the 12th century. However, most published works were still produced through traditional block printing techniques. The publication of a Taoist text inscribed with the name of Torajin Khotan, Ogede's wife, is one of the first printed works sponsored by the Mongols. In 1273, the Mongols created the Imperial Library Directorate, a government-sponsored printing office. The Yuan government established centers for printing throughout China. Local schools and government agencies were funded to support the publishing of books. Private printing businesses also flourished under the Yuan. They published a diverse range of works, and printed educational, literary, medical, religious, and historical texts. The volume of printed materials was vast. In 1312, 1,000 copies of a Buddhist text commented by Kazgi Odsir were printed just within Beijing. By 1328, annual sales of printed calendars and almanacs reached over 3 million in the Yuan dynasty. One of the more notable applications of printing technology was the chow, the paper money of the Yuan. Chow were made from the bark of mulberry trees. The Yuan government used woodblocks to print paper money, but switched to bronze plates in 1275. The Mongols experimented with establishing the Chinese-style paper monetary system in Mongol-controlled territories outside of China. 
The Yuan minister Bolid was sent to Iran, where he explained Yuan paper money to the Il Khanate court of Gaikatu. The Il Khanate government issued paper money in 1294, but public distrust of the exotic new currency doomed the experiment. Foreign observers took note of Yuan printing technology. Marco Polo documented the Yuan printing of paper money and almanac pamphlets called Takuini. The vizier Rashid al Din recognized that printing was a valuable technological breakthrough, and expressed regret that the Mongol experiment with printing paper money had failed in the Muslim world. Rashid al Din's view was not shared by other chroniclers in the Middle East, who were critical of the experiment's disruptive impact on the Il Khanate. Ceramics <inaudible> 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 In Chinese ceramics the period was one of expansion, with the great innovation the development in Jingzhen ware of underglaze painted blue and white pottery. This seems to have begun in the early decades of the 14th century, and by the end of the dynasty was mature and well established. Other major types of wares continued without a sharp break in their development, but there was a general trend to some larger size pieces, and more decoration. This is often seen as a decline from song refinement. Exports expanded considerably, especially to the Islamic world. Topic: Society. Topic: Imperial lifestyle. Since its invention in 1269, the Fags Pa script, a unified script for spelling Mongolian, Tibetan, and Chinese languages, was preserved in the court until the end of the dynasty. Most of the emperors could not master written Chinese, but they could generally converse well in the language. The Mongol custom of long-standing Kuta, marriage alliance with Mongol clans, the Angarat, and the Ikers, kept the imperial blood purely Mongol until the reign of Tu Timur Emperor Wenzong, whose mother was a Tangut concubine. The Mongol emperors had built large palaces and pavilions, but some still continued to live as nomads at times. Tu Timur was an example of a Yuan emperor who actively sponsored cultural activities, including in his imperial capacity and in his personal activities such as writing poetry, painting, reading Chinese classical texts, and ordering the compilation of books. The average Mongol garrison family of the Yuan dynasty seems to have lived a life of decaying rural leisure, with income from the harvests of their Chinese tenants eaten up by costs of equipping and dispatching men for their tours of duty. The Mongols practiced debt slavery, and by 1290 in all parts of the Mongol Empire commoners were selling their children into slavery. Seeing this as damaging to the Mongol nation, Kublai in 1291 forbade the sale abroad of Mongols. Kublai wished to persuade the Chinese that he was becoming increasingly sinicized while maintaining his Mongolian credentials with his own people. He set up a civilian administration to rule, built a capital within China, supported Chinese religions and culture, and devised suitable economic and political institutions for the court. But at the same time he never abandoned his Mongolian heritage. Culture In the China of the Yuan, or Mongol era, various important developments in the arts occurred or continued in their development, including the areas of painting, mathematics, calligraphy, poetry, and theater, with many great artists and writers being famous today. Due to the coming together of painting, poetry, and calligraphy at this time many of the artists practicing these different pursuits were the same individuals, though perhaps more famed for one area of their achievements than others. Often in terms of the further development of landscape painting as well as the classical joining together of the arts of painting, poetry, and calligraphy, the Song dynasty and the Yuan dynasty are linked together. In Chinese painting during the Yuan dynasty there were many famous painters. In the area of calligraphy many of the great calligraphers were from the Yuan dynasty era. In Yuan poetry, the main development was the Ku, which was used among other poetic forms by most of the famous Yuan poets. Many of the poets were also involved in the major developments in the theatre during this time, and the other way around, with people important in the theatre becoming famous through the development of the sank type of coup. One of the key factors in the mix of the Zahu variety show was the incorporation of poetry both classical and of the newer coup form. One of the important cultural developments during the Yuan era was the consolidation of poetry, painting, and calligraphy into a unified piece of the type that tends to come to mind when people think of classical Chinese art. Another important aspect of Yuan times is the increasing incorporation of the then-current, vernacular Chinese into both the Ku form of poetry and the Zahu variety show. 
Another important consideration regarding Yuan dynasty arts and culture is that so much of it has survived in China, relatively to works from the Tang dynasty and Song dynasty, which have often been better preserved in places such as the Shoswan, in Japan. Religion There were many religions practiced during the Yuan dynasty, such as Buddhism, Islam, Christianity and Manichaeism. The establishment of the Yuan dynasty had dramatically increased the number of Muslims in China. However, unlike the Western Khanates, the Yuan dynasty never converted to Islam. Instead, Kublai Khan, the founder of the Yuan dynasty, favored Buddhism, especially the Tibetan variants. As a result, Tibetan Buddhism was established as the de facto state religion. The top-level department and government agency known as the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs was set up in Kanbalik modern Beijing to supervise Buddhist monks throughout the empire. Since Kublai Khan only esteemed the Sakya sect of Tibetan Buddhism, other religions became less important. He and his successors kept a Sakya imperial preceptor at court. Before the end of the Yuan dynasty, 14 leaders of the Sakya sect had held the post of imperial preceptor, thereby enjoying special power. Furthermore, Mongol patronage of Buddhism resulted in a number of monuments of Buddhist art. Mongolian Buddhist translations, almost all from Tibetan originals, began on a large scale after 1300. Many Mongols of the upper class such as the Jalayir and the Oronar nobles as well as the emperors also patronized Confucian scholars and institutions. A considerable number of Confucian and Chinese historical works were translated into the Mongolian language. At the same time the Mongols imported Central Asian Muslims to serve as administrators in China, the Mongols also sent Hans and Khitans from China to serve as administrators over the Muslim population in Bukhara in Central Asia, using foreigners to curtail the power of the local peoples of both lands. Genghis Khan and the following Yuan emperors forbade Islamic practices like halal butchering, forcing Mongol methods of butchering animals on Muslims, and other restrictive degrees continued. Muslims had to slaughter sheep in secret. Genghis Khan directly called Muslims and Jews, slaves, and demanded that they follow the Mongol method of eating rather than the halal method. Circumcision was also forbidden. Jews were also affected and forbidden by the Mongols to eat kosher. Among all the subject alien peoples only the Wei Wei say we do not eat Mongol food, Singhis Khan replied, by the aid of heaven we have pacified you, you are our slaves. Yet you do not eat our food or drink. How can this be right? He thereupon made them eat. If you slaughter sheep, you will be considered guilty of a crime. He issued a regulation to that effect. In 1279-1280 under Kubilay, all the Muslims say, if someone else slaughters the animal, we do not eat. Because the poor people are upset by this, from now on, Musulman Muslim Wei Wei and Zuhu Jewish Wei Wei, no matter who kills the animal will eat it and must cease slaughtering sheep themselves, and cease the rite of circumcision. The Muslims in the Simu class revolted against the Yuan dynasty in the ISPAH rebellion, but the rebellion was crushed and the Muslims were massacred by the Yuan loyalist commander Chen Yuding. Some Muslim communities had the name in Chinese meaning, barracks, and also meaning, thanks. Many Wei Muslims claim it is because that they played an important role in overthrowing the Mongols and it was named in thanks by the Hans for assisting them. During the Ming conquest of Yunnan, Muslim generals Mu Ying and Lan Yu led Muslim troops loyal to the Ming dynasty against Mongol and Muslim troops loyal to the Yuan dynasty. Hindu statues were found in Chenzhou dating to the Yuan period. Topic: <laughs> Social classes. Politically, the system of government created by Kublai Khan was the product of a compromise between Mongolian patrimonial feudalism and the traditional Chinese autocratic bureaucratic system. Nevertheless, socially the educated Chinese elite were in general not given the degree of esteem that they had been accorded previously under native Chinese dynasties. Although the traditional Chinese elite were not given their share of power, the Mongols and the Semurin various allied groups from Central Asia and the western end of the empire largely remained strangers to the mainstream Chinese culture, and this dichotomy gave the Yuan regime a somewhat strong colonial coloration. The unequal treatment is possibly due to the fear of transferring power to the ethnic Chinese under their rule. The Mongols and Semurin were given certain advantages in the dynasty, and this would last even after the restoration of the imperial examination in the early 14th century. 
In general there were very few North Chinese or Southerners reaching the highest post in the government compared with the possibility that Persians did so in the Ilkhanate. Later the Yongle Emperor of the Ming dynasty also mentioned the discrimination that existed during the Yuan dynasty. In response to an objection against the use of barbarians in his government, the Yongle Emperor answered, Discrimination was used by the Mongols during the Yuan dynasty, who employed only Mongols and Tartars, and discarded northern and southern Chinese and this was precisely the cause that brought disaster upon them." The Mongols had employed foreigners long before the reign of Kublai Khan, the founder of the Yuan dynasty. But during Kublai's reign a hierarchy of reliability was introduced in China. The population was divided into the following classes. Mongols Simu, consisting of non-Mongol foreigners from the West and Central Asia, like Buddhist Uyghurs from Turfan, Jews, Nestorian Christians, and Muslims from Central Asia. Han, or all subjects of the former Jin dynasty, including Hans, Khitans, Yurchins in northern China, and other peoples like Koreans. Southerners, or all subjects of the former Southern Song dynasty, including Hans and minority native ethnic groups in southern China, sometimes called Manzi. During the Yuan partner merchants and non-Mongol overseers were usually either immigrants or local ethnic groups. Thus, in China they were Uyghur Buddhists, Turkestani and Persian Muslims, and Christians. Foreigners from outside the Mongol Empire entirely, such as the Polo family, were everywhere welcomed. At the same time the Mongols imported Central Asian Muslims to serve as administrators in China, the Mongols also sent Hans and Khitans from China to serve as administrators over the Muslim population in Bukhara in Central Asia, using foreigners to curtail the power of the local peoples of both lands. Hans were moved to Central Asian areas like Besh Balak, Almalik, and Samarkand by the Mongols where they worked as artisans and farmers. Alans were recruited into the Mongol forces with one unit called Right Alan Guard which was combined with recently surrendered soldiers, Mongols, and Chinese soldiers stationed in the area of the former kingdom of Kocho and in Besh Balik the Mongols established a Chinese military colony led by Chinese general Qi Kongzi after the Mongol conquest of Central Asia by Genghis Khan, foreigners were chosen as administrators and co-management with Chinese and Kara Kites of gardens and fields in Samarkand was put upon the Muslims as a requirement since Muslims were not allowed to manage without them. The Mongol-appointed governor of Samarkand was a Kara Kitae held the title Taishi, familiar with Chinese culture his name was Ahai. Han officials and colonists were sent by the Mongol Yuan dynasty to areas of Lingbai province, Haining Lu Yilan Zhou Qian Despite the high position given to Muslims, some policies of the Yuan emperors severely discriminated against them, restricting halal slaughter and other Islamic practices like circumcision, as well as kosher butchering for Jews, forcing them to eat food the Mongol way. Toward the end, corruption and the persecution became so severe that Muslim generals joined Hans in rebelling against the Mongols. The Ming founder Zhu Yuanzang had Muslim generals like Lan Yu who rebelled against the Mongols and defeated them in combat. Some Muslim communities had a Chinese surname which meant barracks and could also mean thanks. Many Wei Muslims claim this is because that they played an important role in overthrowing the Mongols and it was given in thanks by the Hans for assisting them. During the war fighting the Mongols, among the Ming emperor Zhu Yuanzang's armies was the Wei Muslim Feng Sheng. The Muslims in the Simu class also revolted against the Yuan dynasty in the ISPAH rebellion but the rebellion was crushed and the Muslims were massacred by the Yuan loyalist commander Chen Yuding. The historian Frederick W. Mote wrote that the usage of the term, social classes, for this system was misleading and that the position of people within the four-class system was not an indication of their actual social power and wealth, but just entailed, degrees of privilege to which they were entitled institutionally and legally, so a person's standing within the classes was not a guarantee of their standing, since there were rich and well socially standing Chinese while there were less rich Mongol and Simu than there were Mongol and Simu who lived in poverty and were ill-treated. The reason for the order of the classes and the reason why people were placed in a certain class was the date they surrendered to the Mongols, and had nothing to do with their ethnicity. The earlier they surrendered to the Mongols, the higher they were placed, the more they held out, the lower they were ranked. The northern Chinese were ranked higher and southern Chinese were ranked lower because southern China withstood and fought to the last before caving in. 
Major commerce during this era gave rise to favorable conditions for private southern Chinese manufacturers and merchants. When the Mongols placed the Uyghurs of the Kingdom of Kocho over the Koreans at the court, the Korean king objected. Then the Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan rebuked the Korean king, saying that the Uyghur king of Kocho was ranked higher than the Karlik Kara Khanid ruler, who in turn was ranked higher than the Korean king, who was ranked last. Because the Uyghurs surrendered to the Mongols first, the Karluk surrendered after the Uyghurs, and the Koreans surrendered last, and that the the Uyghurs surrendered peacefully without violently resisting. Japanese historians like Uematsu, Sugiyama, and Morita criticized the perception that a four class system existed under Mongol rule, and Fanata Yoshiyuki questioned the very existence of the Simu as a class. <laughs> <laughs> Administrative divisions The territory of the Yuan dynasty was divided into the central region Fuli governed by the central secretariat and places under control of various provinces Xingsheng or branch secretariats, Xing Zhang Shu Sheng as well as the region under the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs. The central region, consisting of present-day Hebei, Shandong, Shaanxi, the southeastern part of present-day Inner Mongolia and the Henan areas to the north of the Yellow River, was considered the most important region of the dynasty and directly governed by the Central Secretariat or Zongshu Sheng at Kanbalik modern Beijing. Similarly, another top-level administrative department called the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs or Zanjiang Yuan held administrative rule over the whole of modern-day Tibet and a part of Sichuan, Qinghai and Kashmir. Kashmir. Branch secretariats or simply provinces, were provincial-level administrative organizations or institutions, though they were not exactly provinces in modern sense. There were eleven «regular» provinces in Yuan dynasty, and their administrations were subordinated to the central secretariat. Below the level of provinces, the largest political division was the circuit, Dao followed by Lu, Lu Fu, Fu and Zhou. These are three kinds of prefecture-like divisions. The lowest political division was the county. Basically, Lu is higher than Fu, and Fu is higher than Zhou, however, the actual relationship between them could be very complicated. Both Lu, Fu, and Zhou could administer counties. Some Fu and Zhou are directly administered by the province, while some exist inside a Lu. A Lu usually administers several counties, along with several Fu and Zhou, and the Fu or Zhou themselves could also administer their own counties. As a result, it is impossible to exactly define how many tiers of divisions there are under a province. This government structure at the provincial level was later inherited and modified by the Ming and Qing dynasties. Gallery See also Notes Topic References Topic Citations Topic Sources Topic Further reading Burge, Bettine, nineteen ninety five Leverett Marriage and the Revival of Widow Chastity in Yuan China Asia Major, Third Series 8-2, JSTOR 41645519. Chan, H. O. K. Lam, De Berry, W. T., E. D. S., 1982. Yuan Thought, Chinese Thought and Religion under the Mongols. New York, New York, Columbia University Press. ISBN 978-0-231-05324-2. Cotterell, Arthur The Imperial Capitals of China – An Inside View of the Celestial Empire. London, England, Pimlico. ISBN 9781845950000. Dardis, John Shun Ti and the End of Yuan Rule in China. In Dennis C. Twitchett, Herbert Frank, John King Fairbank. The Cambridge History of China, Vol. 6, Alien Regimes and Border States, 710-1368. Cambridge University Press. pp. 561-586. ISBN 978-0-521-24331-5. Abre, Patricia Buckley November 2009. 
Chinese Civilization, a Sourcebook 2nd ed. Simon & Schuster. ISBN 978-1-4391-8839-2. Endicott West, Elizabeth Imperial Governance in Yuan Times. Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. 46 2, 523-549. Doi 10.2307/2,719,142. JSTOR 2,719,142. Endicott West, Elizabeth. 1994. The Yuan Government and Society. In Dennis C. Twitchett, Herbert Frank, John King Fairbank. The Cambridge History of China, Volume 6: Alien Regimes and Border States, 710-1368. Cambridge University Press. pp. 587–615. ISBN 978-0-521-24331-5. Langhua, John D. China Under Mongol Rules. Princeton, Princeton University Press. ISBN 978-0-691-10110-1. Langhua, John D. Report on the Research Conference, The Impact of Mongol Domination on Chinese Civilization. Sung Studies Newsletter, 13-82-90. JSTOR 23497251. Paladin, Anne Chronicle of the China Emperors. London, England, Thames and Hudson. ISBN 978-0-500-05090-3. Saunders, John Joseph 2001 1971. The History of the Mongol Conquests. University of Pennsylvania Press. ISBN 978-0-812-21766-7. Owen, Stephen, The Yuan and Ming Dynasties, in Stephen Owen, ed. An Anthology of Chinese Literature, Beginnings to 1911. New York, W. W. Norton, 1997. P. 723-743 Archive. Directory of Scholars Working in Sung, Liao, Qin and Yuan, 1987. Directory of Scholars Working in Sung, Liao, Qin and Yuan. Bulletin of Sung and Yuan Studies, No. 19. Society for Song, Yuan, and Conquest Dynasty Studies, 224-54. JSTOR 23497542. Topic. External links Media related to Yuan Dynasty at Wikimedia Commons